Bill Nanny for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to visit Korea. Um, so the first two lectures uh, will be introductory. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask me. So let's start with the definition of differentials. I want to consider so a building differential. Let me denote it by omega. Well, so, so this is very simple. It's just a uh, holomorphic. One form, so on the Riemann surface, on a smooth algebraic curve defined over C. It's a complex algebraic curve X. Okay. Um, so what is a holomorphic one form? So if we consider Riemann surface, then locally you have a uh, uh, complex coordinate z. That means locally you can write omega as a holomorphic function times dz. That is, so omega is equal to fz times dz. So here f is a local holomorphic function. So such that if you change your coordinate to another chart, then this has to satisfy the compatibility condition. Right? This is only a locally defined uh, expression. Um, if you know a little bit about L geometry, you can also formulate this in a more algebraic term. So um, the other word, so currently, So a holomorphic one form means you get a holomorphic section of, so what is one form? That is section of uh, the cotangent line bundle or the canonical line bundle of the curve. Right? So omega can be re regarded as a section of the canonical line bundle of the underlying curve x. So I use k to denote the canonical line bundle. Okay. So we are kx. Is a canonical. Or if you are more Different geometric topological, this is the cotangent holomorphic line bundle of X. Okay. So for now, I prefer using this local expression to give you another, maybe less uh, well known expression for this holomorphic line form. So, first of all, so I, I do have one more assumption. So. Let's assume, always, from now on, this omega is non-trivial, that it is not identical with zero. Okay. Assume omega is not identical with zero. It might still have some isolated zeros. That's OK. Well, I mean, it can have some isolated zeros, but at least away from zeros. So if this function fz is non-zero locally, then you can pick some suitable coordinate so that you can actually represent omega in a more standard way. So if, um, maybe let me put it this way. So maybe the first one. Away from the zeros of omega. Again, so if you pick some suitable local coordinate, you can write omega in a more standard form. So take some suitable local coordinate so so we can write omega actually just as d of z where z is some um, suitable local coordinate in other words if you just integrate omega away from zero so z is just if you integrate omega that recovers this standard coordinate z and if i say it's non-zero that Locally gives you a new coordinate by integrating omega. 
So if you pick this standard coordinate, just write omega as d of z. It just looks like, well, if I consider this z as a standard coordinate on the Euclidean plane, so let's, let's maybe like put this one away from zeros. So let's consider z, write it as, for this standard coordinate, x plus i y. So as the standard coordinate for the Euclidean plane, r2, OK? So if I write r2 here, use a standard horizontal and vertical coordinates x and y, I see in the Euclidean metric, right? That's the x and y axis. In other words, so this standard coordinate z induces locally a Euclidean metric, like a flat metric, away from zeros of omega. Okay. And if you see, if I have another choice for this z, if I have something like d, say, prime, which represents omega, then if you set this to be d z prime, okay, for another local coordinate. Or just by the fundamental theorem of calculus, so these two functions, they have the same derivative. So if you take their antiderivatives, they are not quite the same coordinates, but they only differ by translation that tells us locally z prime equals z plus some constant. Right. But again, so if you only add a constant, that means you shift your coordinate plane a little bit. It does not change the underlying flat metric. So from this, the first important thing to remember, away from the zeros of omega, so actually omega induces a flat metric in the Euclidean sense, away from its zeros. OK. So let me repeat one more time. So omega has some isolated zeros, at least away from those zeros. So using the standard expression omega equal to dz, it induces a flat metric. Okay. I'll give you some global examples later, but so far this is a local description. So the other case, what happens at a zero of omega? Okay. So let's take a look. I'd like to specify the zero type of omega. In other words, I want to fix the vanishing order of omega at a zero. So the next case. Now suppose P is a zero of omega of order, let's call it, say, M. So say bigger than equal to zero. So how do you get a zero of order m from a different form? So again, if you take some suitable local coordinate, so we can write omega as d of, so we want to get, suppose I set this local coordinate where uh, C, sorry. So this is Z with P given by the origin, Z equals zero. So you can write omega as D of Z to the N plus first. Because if you differentiate this, you see you will get Z to the Nth times DZ times some non-zero constant. Right? So this is up to scaling, it's just Z to the Nth DZ. Okay. In other words, so here we see Omega has a zero as the origin, p, with one shot m. But the function you differentiate locally is z to the m plus first, because it brings down the exponent by one. Okay. Well, I'd like to consider this from the viewpoint of metric. So away from the origin, so then if z is not zero, so omega is not zero, so nearby I have an induced flat metric. So what happens if you view this origin p under the nearby flat metric. The picture you should think of is that, so here I have dz in some sense, I write it d of z. I only have one copy of this current z. Locally I see in a like flat disk, 
as a metric neighborhood of the point. And here, if m is bigger than 0, I will have certainly m plus 1 is bigger than 1. That means I will have more than 1. Indeed, m plus 1 many flat disks glued consecutively to form a flat neighborhood of this special point P. Okay. So I'll write down this sentence and draw a picture for you. Okay. So under the flat metric to nearby P, so P actually looks like is a called a cone point of total angle given by two pi times this exponent n plus one. So what do I mean by this? If I have say just two pi around the point, then you just get a local neighborhood that looks like Euclidean plane. If I get any higher multiple of two pi, that means locally it cannot be flat. It has a like excess angles. So let me draw a picture to justify this sentence. But let me see that this is an important thing to keep in mind, okay? Let's do an example. For example, let's do a, a cone point of angle, say just 4 pi, okay? This is 2 pi times 2. Okay. So that means I want to glue two copies of flat disk consecutively to form a neighborhood of P. So what I can do is that, so let me take actually four copies of half disks. Okay, so these are some neighborhood of, of P. I have to tell you how to glue the edges of the half disks. So let's do this one, let's label it by, by one, and glue to the bottom one by one, okay? So I glue this edge with this one, just by translation, okay? The next one, let's label the other edge here by two, and I glue this one to to this edge, let's label it by two. And then I glue this one three, three here, and then four, four. Okay. So I take four copies of um, the same size half disks. I label their boundary edges by these numbers. And these are, you can think of these are the same vector, I just glue them parallelly, okay? So I claim, after gluing, all the centers become the same point, P. Let's check that. So I can go around counterclockwise. See, if I go this way, four goes to one, then one goes down here, and continue, goes to two, and two goes to this two, and continue to three, and three goes down, goes to the other four, and four goes back to this four. Okay, in other words, you see, I go this way. And if you really glue them together, don't cut. The picture looks like you have, in some sense, uh, like a double cover of the, like the, 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 the single disk. So the topological picture is the following. So you have like two disks, so, but somehow I just cut it open so that it becomes four half disks. And they map to the one disk downstairs. Okay. It looks like a double cover in this case. Ramified over the origin. But here the origin is just the same, it's hard to draw the picture. Some sense. Okay. Point is P. Okay. okay. And similarly, if we have a component of um, angle 2 pi times n plus 1, you need to take 2 n plus 2 half disks and glue it consecutively like that. And after all, you can check all the centers of disk will become the same point. Okay. So that's how the flat geometry looks like around the zero of the differential. And the angle here, this module of 2 pi, is one more than the one shot that just becomes here. You have d of z to the n plus first. So these two numbers are the same. So we get a 
like a dictionary between a uh, correspondence between this cone angle and the Vanish order of uh, zero. Okay. So any questions? Let me present you some uh, global examples. Okay. So since omega has only finite many special components, and everywhere else it just looks like you could even play, you should picture the underlying Riemann surface. It could be the flat metric as some kind of uh, plane polygon, where those special components will sit at the vertices of the polygon, and the edges of the polygon will be glued in suitable way so that it closed up to the Riemann surface. Okay. Let's draw some polygons and read off the corresponding form. So this is an example of genus 1, where I use G to denote the genus of the Riemann surface, which is the genus of the Riemann surface X. So genus 1 means torus. So the standard picture, you can imagine that I take a parallelogram, right? In the Euclidean plane, OK? So it has two pairs of parallel edges, right? If I label them by, say, A, A, B, and B. So I glue A with A just by translation. I move this up and glue, and glue the other two edges B and B, and it's clo close up to be a torus, right? Where A is here, and B is there. And clearly, so this is a flat torus, because I put it inside the Euclidean plane, right? So it really has a flat structure. You may wonder what happens at the vertex. Well, in this case, these four points, will be glued together. Right? But that's fine. It does not give you any special point, because I mean, there are many ways to say it. If you add up the angles, you still get 2 pi. right? So it's not higher than 2 pi. And similarly, you can re-represent this flat torus by cut and paste, so that this vertex can actually become the interior point. So this flat torus actually is everywhere flat. There's no cone point. So that corresponds to a, like a nowhere vanishing differential. Omega on the torus. And that makes sense, right? Because we know on like torus or a little bit curve, the conical line boundary is trivial. Any not identical zero section is a is a just a trivial section, so it has no zero. So it's everywhere flat. This is a, like a basic example. So once you go to higher genus, because on one, the conical line bundle has degree 2 times genus minus 2. And the total zeros of omega add up, the total zero order of omega add up to be the degree of the conical line bundle, which is 2g minus 2. That means you will def definitely see some isolated zeros. So let's do some examples in genus 2. So maybe let's put, put a remark. So the um, so the total zero order of omega is equal to the degree of the conical bundle, which is two g minus two, which tells us when genus is bigger than one, you will definitely see some special zeros. Okay. Let's do the genus 2 example. Okay. Actually, I'll give you two examples in genus 2, because we have not only the Riemann surface, but also the special differential. And depends on the zero type, you will see different presentations. Let me start from the first one. 
So this is why I need different colors. So I just take four vectors. Let's call them V1, V2, V3, V4. And just connect them consecutively again in the Euclidean plane. So let me copy them again and uh, change the order. Let me start from V4. Then I do V3. And then V2. The last one is V1. Okay? They, they must close up because both of them represent V1 plus V2 plus V3, V4. Okay. So I get an octagon, a special octagon. Sorry, I should just use. Okay? So it's an octagon with eight edges that decompose into four pairs, VI and VI. So each pair, VI and VI, they are parallel vectors. Now I just perform the gluing procedure. Glue V1 with V1 by translation. V2 with V2 with V3 with V4. I claim after this gluing, all the eight vertices actually become the same point. So let's check that. This is a, actually an easy check. So let's start from this far left point. Let's call this point P. Okay. okay. So this belongs to the left end point of V1. Right? This is the left end point of this V1. And because this V1 is glued to the other copy of V1, that means the other left end point of V1 must also be P. Okay. Let's glue this together. So this P will also be the other point P because both of them are the same left end point of V1, okay? Glue V1 to V1, so I label this by P, so this point becomes T. Now we use this point P as the upper end point of V2. Now I glue V2 to V2, that tells us this point has to be also P. Now we use this P as the left end point of V3, and glue with this V3, that means this P will be the same as that point. And now I have both endpoints of V4 are P, so here are P, P because V4 glues here. And finally, both endpoints of V1s are P, the same as And both endpoints of V2s are still P. Let's check. All the eight vertices now are all labeled by the same P. Right? That means they are glued together. Okay? So in general, when you have such polygon picture with edges glued in pairs, you can just start from one vertex and perform this check. All right, so we get one special cone point. Let's take a look at the angle. So the angle at P is, we just add up the total angle of octagon, right? Octagon, I guess you have uh, six, you can decompose these in six triangles, that is, is six pi. Right. Just add up the total angle. Okay, so 6 pi is 3 times 2 pi. Okay. So let's recall the correspondence between the angle and the zero order. So the, the angle, this multiple, is always one higher than the one shot order. So this will correspond to so a differential omega. With uh, three minus one is is two with a double zero at p. Okay, so maybe I should write this as two plus one times two pi. So this is the one shot order. Okay. So let's perform a few more checks. So you may wonder if I get a double zero, right? According to this formula. So 2g minus 2 is 2. Genus should be 2. Right. Can we see the genus directly from this topological picture? Because I have the surface here, even without, without knowing the metric, without knowing the form, 
we should be able to read off the genus. That we can check. So genus, so let's perform the, so let's do a check. Let's do the topological polar characteristic. So actually I have a, a cell decomposition of the surface, right? So I have my zero cells, so that means the vertices. It looks like I have eight vertices, but in the end they are all glued to be the same point, right? So that means in the true cell decomposition of the surface, I only get one vertex, right? I have one vertex. This means it's point P, okay? So how many edges? One cells are there. It looks like I have eight edges. Again, so they are glued into four pairs. So they are only V1, V2, V3, V4, four different one cells, right? Like four like uh, edges. This is V1, V4. And how many two cells, faces are there? I only have one face, just the interior of the polygon, right? Just one face. So if you apply the topological characteristic formula that tells it, 2 minus 2g, right, is equal to, you do the alternating sum, 1 minus 4 plus 1, it tells us genus is equal to 2. Right. And also we know in this case 2g minus 2 is also 2. That means whatever differential you get, the total zero order should be equal to 2. So this is a special case. I only get a unique zero which is a double zero. That's okay, because I know the total zero should be two. Okay. Maybe let me say a little more about the correspondence between this polygon picture and the one form. So you may wonder, if I just take this polygon picture, where can I read off this differential omega? So let me explain a little bit more about that. I mean, there's not much to say indeed, because if you ignore the special point P for now, so everywhere away from P, if I take an interior point, well, I can just use a standard coordinate Z in the Euclidean plane. I just do, in this example, just again, so away from P. In this example, I just write omega equals DZ, where Z is a coordinate of this Euclidean plane. Because my surface now is literally this polygon inside Euclidean plane. And what happens if I take a point on the edge? Let, let's take a point on the edge, but not P. Maybe in the interior of the edge, so let's take a point here. But keep in mind, this point is the same as that point, right? But claim this doesn't matter, so the same thing still works. If I look at the neighborhood of this point, okay. Okay, I want to describe my local coordinate. So here, so this, actually they are far away from each other, so I take a neighborhood here, maybe let's call it Z1, usually called local coordinate. Here I have another neighborhood in the Euclidean plane, we call it Z2, okay? So, but the things, my V3 and the other copy of V3, they are glued parallelly. That means these two local coordinates, Z1, Z2, they only differ by translation. So even for that point in the interior of the edge, I have in that picture Z1 is equal to Z2 plus a constant. That tells us even if they are not globally different coordinate, they differ by some non-zero constant, by this shift. If I differentiate, the constant goes away. So omega is still well defined dz1 is equal to dz2. And that defines the omega, right? Okay. So I'm not saying my coordinates are globally defined. They are only local coordinates. Nevertheless, the transition function between these charts under the flat metric actually is uh, like, like translation, right? By adding some constant. If I differentiate, my form omega is still well defined. That means I get a almost everywhere defined holomorphic form away from P, right? Now P is only one isolated singularity, and you can check, say, by some kind of Riemann extension theorem. So this form extends, and again, according to the angle information, so this is 6 pi, so by the formula, we know that locally at P, omega must look like D of the cube. So I have three copies of this glued together. 
if you different d of the cube, you get z squared dz. That means you have a double zero. So from now on, you see this example basically illustrates the correspondence between holomorphic differentials and such like flat polygon picture. And the cone points correspond to zeros of omega, and the cone angle determine the zero order of omega. Okay. So any question about this example? Can I ask a sure. You see, if I have my local current z, z is a, I should say, maybe R2 is really called to c, yeah, is a conical way. So then I have the complex structure, right, because I have a complex local current. Yes. But at po point P? At point P, a, you can think of, in some sense, again, in this case, I have a, like a sort of a triple cover. So you can think of, I have a standard Euclidean plane, and I pull back. So I have a triple cover, something like a U maps to Z equal to U cube. And if I, I mean, so this, this, this U coronet is my <laughs> local coronet at, uh, for the complex structure. So the polygon, the polygon change things the, the complex, complex structure change. change. Yeah. You also see it even in the genes one case, right? If I change the shape of yes. the parallelogram, like a uni square and uh, another arbitrary parallelogram, they correspond to different most likely different uh, complex structures or gene invariant of the elliptic curve. Yeah, so that's a good point. So, but let's keep in mind, a holomorphic differential carries more information than the complex structure. If you just give me a Riemann surface of genes G, it has many, many different differentials, right? I'm saying here, if I pick a differential that already implicitly determines not only the complex structure, but also this actual flat structure. But to answer your question again, so as a special point, you can just think of well, from this branch cover viewpoint. So, any other questions? So, genus two case only one zero if we do order two, but how about the genus three case? Well, even for genes two, I haven't finished. I said I wanted to give you two examples in genes two. So the other case is genes two with two simple zeros. I can still produce a picture like that. But I just want, want to make sure, at least for this example, it's clear. Okay. <coughs> okay. Right, so I guess why don't I just keep this picture here? Let me just do it. Another picture. Just to compare. So maybe I should say this genes two with a double zero. So let's do another example of genes two. So let me take another polygon. Now I need five colors, but I only have four. So instead, I'll just use one color, but label them by different letters. Let's do V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. Let's do it again, so it's V5, V4, V3, V2. Now I have 10 edges that break into five groups of parallel edges. So this is the interior, then so I close up, I get a uh, surface. So let's check what happens to the vertices. Let's do the same thing. Let's start with from this point. Let's call it P, okay? So I will use this point P as a left end point of V1. So here I have another left end point of V1, so this point is P. I consider it as an upper end point of V2, so I have this upper end point of V2, which is also P. Now I consider this as a left end point of V3, so here I have a left end point of V3. So I consider this as a lower end point of V4, here I have the lower end point of V4. And this is the upper end point of V5, here I have the upper end point of V5. 
But I get back to the original point I started. Okay, I haven't touched the other remaining vertices, right? So, and similarly, if I label this by Q, so this is the upper endpoint V4, so this is Q. And then this is V3, and this is V3, that point is Q. And this is V2, and V2, that point is Q. And here V1, PQ, so V1 is PQ. V5 is PQ, so V5 is PQ. So I guess I'm done. So you see the 10 vertices, now they become like two groups. Five of them are identified as P, the other five are identified as Q. Right? And P and Q are distinct points. But also because this parallel picture, you can check that at both P and Q, the total angle is the same, equal to four times pi. Again, so the total angle, if you add up over both P and, P and Q, the 10 vertices, because it's a decagon, 10 edges, you get 8 pi. And by this parallel structure, you can easily check that at P is half of 8 pi is 4 pi, 4, 4, 4 times pi, at Q is another 4 pi. What is 4 pi? 4 pi is 2 times 2 pi. And this is 1 plus 1 times 2 pi. That tells us the corresponding one form, omega, has two distinct simple zeros at P and Q. Right. Again, so the total zero order is one plus one, two simple zeros, that is still two. So I still have a James 2 Riemann surface. But this one form has a different behavior. Right. This, I should add, this is, this is two simple zeros. Okay. <coughs> so at each simple zero P and Q, omega looks like D of Z square, we got Z times DZ. So, okay. okay. And maybe to get back to your question, if I have omega locally looks like d of z square, and it sort of tells us how to determine the true current z around the point c p or q, because you can just integrate omega. That does not give you z, but give you z square. You can pick a say a square root in this case to get plus or minus z to give you a local current at p. So in general, you have a compound you can integrate omega, but that does not give you z. It gives you z to some power. You take the root. Anyway, so any other question about this example? Just one minor remark. So such polygonal presentation is not canonical. Because when I say this uh, expression in terms of this flat polygon, I mean, I can always cut and paste so that the polygon may look very different but it still represents the same one form. Maybe I'll just put it as a remark. So the one form, omega, is more intrinsic. This representation by polygon is nice, but it's n there's no canonical way to represent it. Um, let me write it here, remark. So one can cut and paste to represent the same omega. Let's just do a simple example, even in the torus case. See, suppose I take the standard torus. This is A, A, B, B, OK? And see, if I cut it open through the diagonal, let's call it diagonal C, OK? I can also represent, just move the left side to the right side. Okay, I can remove it and uh, glue and represent this as a special parallelogram. Right? I can do it like this. But this is still C, C. This is maybe that's just too solid. C. This is A, A, B, 
this vertical thing becomes B. So these two parallelograms, they look different. Nevertheless, they represent the same underlying differential than Riemann surface torus. The thing is because I cut and paste only by translation, so my local coordinate change still is given by Z to some Z plus constant. My form is always by differentiation. So whenever I cut and paste by <laughs> parallel translation, it does not change the underlying differential form. So that's why you may think of, oh, I have this polygon, I have another polygon which looks like very long and thin. But they might be the same or close to each other because we can cut and paste so that it looks very different. Okay. So these are some isolated examples. I'd like to put differentials of the same type into a parameter space, a modular space, by fixing the type of the zeros. Okay. In other words, for example, here, if I want to consider such picture, that means I only consider genes two different shows with two simple zeros. And here is a different object, because these are double zeros. Okay. These are some um, like discrete invariant I'd like to fix first. So the total zero order is 2g minus 2. If I want to fix the type of zeros, that means I need to fix the tube of positive integers so that their sum is 2g minus 2. That means I have an integral partition of 2g minus 2 to determine the zero type of omega. So let's fix it. So I always denote by this mu m1. Where so m i, they are positive integers, and the sum of m i is two g minus two. Okay. So also assume the genus is bigger than two to make the bigger than one to make the examples more interesting. So I want to consider all differentials on genes G Riemann surfaces of zero type mu. So let's first create a set to parameterize such differentials. To define, so my notation is H mu. So H stands for holomorphic differentials, or later it means Hodge bundle. Let's use H. So first defined as a set consisting of all possible pairs of genes G Riemann surfaces that admit a differential of type mu. So where x is some genes G Riemann surface. Okay, not necessarily fixed. X can vary. Okay, such that omega is a differential on x. So so it's a section of the conical line bundle, such that the zero type of omega. So let me write it this way. So the underlying zero of omega is of type mu, that means I have m1 p1 plus m2 p2 plus mn pn. So underlying zero divisor is of this type mu. So we are pi's in x are distinct points. Okay. So let me say it one more time. I consider all possible pairs of uh, genes G Riemann surface along with a holomorphic differential of type mu. That means omega has an underlying zero divisor given by n distinct zeros, p1 up to pn. Each pi has vanishing order given by mi. So this m coefficients is determined already by the signature mu. Okay. So I'll say that simply say that this means omega is of type mu. Okay. For example, here, I would say this belongs to, this example belongs to the strata, sorry, the uh, set H11, because omega has two simple zeros, so one order one, one. Does this notation H make sense? Okay. So far, it's only a set, okay.
So this HMU actually is called I'll explain this terminology soon. So let's write down stratum of holomorphic differentials of type mu. Okay. So I already explained this type mu thing here. So why do I call it a strata? Strata means, so if you <laughs> put this H mu together by varying the signature, this partition mu, it gives you some stratification of uh, like total space. What is a total space? So let's put the H mu together. So this strata means, so if I consider the union of all these H mu by all mu as a partition of 2g minus 2. In other words, regardless of the zero type, I just consider all possible holomorphic differentials on possible, all possible genus G Riemann surfaces. Well, this actually gives you the, the so-called Hodge bundle. So over so-called mg, this is a the modular space of genus G curves, or genus G curves. Okay. So why? Because if I pick a point in this modular space, just means I pick a smooth Riemann surface X. And what is a Hodge bundle definition? The fiber of the Hodge bundle, the fiber over X is given by exactly the space of holomorphic one-forms on X. And now I take the union of all possible one-forms, now I should say maybe the hot bundle minus the zero section, because I assume the omega is not identical to zero. But modulo this minor issue, this union of H mu does give you a stratification of the total space of holomorphic differentials, or uh, sections of conical line bundles. And when you vary in mu, so for example, you could have at the beginning 2g minus 2 simple zeros, but for some special mu, maybe the zero order becomes increasing. Or you might merge two simple zero to become a double zero. And then you may in the end have, have uh, some very special stratum that has a unique zero of order 2g minus 2. Right? This is what I meant by the stratification of the Hodge bundle. All right. Well, again, so this does not quite justify the topology or geom geometry. It looks like I have a union of a bunch of sets that give me. So this Hodge bundle actually is nice. So maybe I should say one thing. This is rank G, right? Because this is a G dimensional vector space. So the Hodge bundle is a rank G vector bundle over MG. That tells us the union of all these stratum is a nice vector bundle. But it still doesn't tell you for each H mu. What is the structure? So now I'm going to justify, at least provide you a very convincing reason. So each, this H mu is not only a set, it has a nice geometric structure. It actually looks like a complex manifold of certain dimension we can easily compute using the signature. Maybe I'll just do this in the last 10 minutes of my first lecture and I'll stop. So H mu. So again, let me put the signature clearly. Mu is m1, mn. So this is the integral partition of 2g minus 2. So write this symbol just means the sum of mi is 2g minus 2. Okay. H mu actually is a is a complex. I should say manifold, but. For those of you who know orbifold, you should think of it as a complex orbifold, but let me ignore that issue as a complex manifold of dimension, complex dimension given by, well, so the genus, I have this number of zeros important, I have n num different zeros, so I have this by n, of dimension 2 times genus p 
plus the number of zeros minus one. So this complex dimension only depends on the number of zeros, does not depend on the each value of zeros. Let me justify this claim. There's a heuristic proof. So it's more important to understand where this number comes from. You have to really understand what does this number stand for. So this number, well, I mean, if I only write 2G, so you can think of this 2G, say, as the rank of the, like the first homology of a genus G Riemann surface, right? I have 2G simply like the basis, but I have n minus 1. What does that mean? I have n special points, right? Well, that means if I mark my Riemann surface by this n points, I look at somehow the relative first homology relative to the n special points, I will have additional n minus 1 relative homology basis by connecting n minus 1 point to one fixed point. In other words, this number really comes from the rank of h1 so x. So my zeros are erased by labeled by p1 up to pn, right? So p1 to pn. So let's recall that my notation omega has underlying zero given by m1p1 plus mnpn. I have n distinct zeros. Now I have a special point, say x omega in h mu. In order to justify I get a complex manifold of this dimension, I need to provide you a local coordinate system around this point with the basis elements exactly 2 t plus n minus 1, this many. I claim I will just use <coughs> this information of the relative homology of the underlying Riemann surface relative to this n zeros. And what can I do if I have this path, right? This, this is just path. Some are absolute, some are relative. But I have a one form. If I have a path, a one form, I can integrate the form omega against the path. These are called <coughs> periods, right? So, so then, let's take, yeah, let's do it. I'll also draw a picture. So I take this relative homology group of this rank, I'll take a basis, let's call it gamma one up to gamma, say two G, and then I have, these are absolute basis, I have gamma two G plus one, up to gamma two G plus N minus one, the basis of this H lower one. So then, I claim if you integrate omega along this basis, so each integral provides you a complex number, right? So altogether, I get 2g plus n minus 1 complex number. So in some sense, it's the dual space h upper 1, right? So this, I claim, is a local coordinate system. I mean, provide local coordinates at this point. So I have a modular space, parameter space. I take this point. I claim this provides a local coordinate system at this point. X omega. Okay, these coordinates are called period coordinates. Yeah, these are called pure terms. So let me first maybe just recall the choice of this basis. So then I'll explain why this provides a local coordinate system. So you can do a standard picture to represent so x topologically. So you have some picture like this. And then you have a bunch of absolute pure right? This is A, B, and A1, B1, A minus 1, B minus 1, and go on. I suppose you have a bunch of relative points. Say this is P1, that's P2, Pn, of this the additional path, right? So this absolute period gives me 2G many 
and then I have additional n minus one red pairs. These are my gamma. So I just integrate omega against the basis. Okay. So the whole thing is to justify, in some sense, if I um, perturb or deform these 2g plus n minus 1 complex numbers, it really gives me a perturbation of this different form in the neighborhood of this stratum. Okay. That's why I quote it as a proof, because I'll just say, for a heuristic reason, you should really think of these period coordinates as the edges of the flat polygon presentation. If you think of omega corresponding to a polygon, uh, those edges are called the v1, v2, blah, blah, right? Then these integrals, these pairs, are really the edges of the polygon. And now you think of, if I change them a little bit, that means I change the shape or the size of the polygon a little bit. But the gluing pattern remains the same. So it does not change the underlying discrete data. So the zeros will still glue in the same pattern. The total angles at each zero does not change. So that's why you remain in the same structure. Okay, let me write down, then I'll recall example, then we stop. Let's see. Okay. So it seems to the pure coordinates. It correspond to edges of the polygon expression of omega. So let's recall this example again. So and I showed you genes two and double zero. In that case, I have an octagon with eight edges, but into four pairs. Right? This is V1, V2, V3, V4. Okay. So this is genes two. And for this example, we checked all the eight vertices identified to be the same point. So I only have one zero. I don't have any relative uh, homology, only one zero, but that's okay, just for the example to explain. But still, I have 2G in this case, genes 2, like four absolute bases just given by the VI, right? In this case, like V1 of the V4, it spans the homology X. X. Uh, if you just mark one point P, that's okay. There's no relative homology, okay? <clears throat> but you see, if I vary this for complex numbers of these vectors, v1, v2, v3, v4, a little bit. It only changes the shape or the size of the polygon a little bit, right? You will still get the eight vertices identified to be the same point. The total angle at this point will still be 6 pi. That means the zero order is not changed. Okay. So in some sense, deforming this pure coordinate means you perturb this polygon expression a little bit, but preserving all the zero types and gluing pattern so it remains in the strategy. This provides a, not quite a rigorous proof, but a really a convincing reason to believe this like, pure coordinates give you a local coordinate system uh, for the strategy mu. Once you buy this heuristic argument, just because I have, I have exactly 2g plus n minus 1 such pairs that determines the complex dimension of the underlying space HMU. And this does not quite depend on the presentation of the polygon, right? Because I'm taking a basis. If you give me another presentation, essentially to control this picture, I only need to know how these basis elements look like. So once I know how the basis elements look like by integrating omega against them, that essentially controls this polygon up to cut and paste, but that's okay, that does, does not change the underlying differential. Okay, so far, so let me just emphasize, we got a quite nice space, like a complex space of complex dimension equal to the rank of the right homology, that is, that is two times genus plus the number of distinct zeros minus one. Okay. All right, I think this is the first hour, let me stop here.